Hi, I'm Andrew Gross, and I'd like to read you chapter one from my new book. They entered the house through the glass doors in the basement, which Becca, their 15-year-old, sometimes left ajar to sneak in friends at night. Upstairs, April Glassman stirred in bed. She'd always had an ear for noises late at night, the curse of having a teenager. Mark could go on snoozing forever. Through fire alarms, she would joke, but April had a built-in antenna for the sound of Becca tiptoeing in past curfew, or Amos, their golden doodle, on guard at the living room window, scratching at the glass over a late-night deer or squirrel. The house was a large red brick Georgian at the end of a private drive off Cat Rock Road in backcountry Greenwich. Every bend in the woods seemed to magnify at night. She opened her eyes and checked the time on the TV cable box, 2.13 a.m., she lay there for a few seconds, listening. She definitely heard something, creaks on the floorboards, muffled voices in the foyer or on the stairs. Suddenly, Amos started barking. Mark, she nudged her husband. Honey, what? Mark Glassman groaned, mashing his pillow into a ball and rolling over. She leaned over and shook his arm. I heard something. Probably just Amos. Maybe he spotted a deer. You know these bastards never decide to come out until 2 a.m. No, she said, alarmed. I heard voices. Okay, okay, Mark exhaled, giving in. He opened his eyes and took a peek at the clock. Er, I'm sure it's just Becca. Their daughter now had a boyfriend at high school, a junior on the wrestling team who drove, introducing a whole new set of complications in their lives. Lately, she'd been sneaking out after the two of them had gone to sleep. No, it's a Sunday, Mark, April replied, recalling how she had kissed her daughter goodnight hours ago and left her curled up in bed with Facebook going strong and a chemistry textbook in her lap. Not anymore. Groggily, he sat up, rubbing a hand across his face and flicked on the light. I'm just going to get up and check out the overnights anyway. As the chief equities trader at Wertheimer Grant, one of Wall Street's oldest firms, it had been months since he slept a whole night through. Singapore opened at midnight, Australia an hour later, Europe and Russia got going at four. Six months ago, he might have made it undisturbed till morning, but that seemed like a lifetime ago. Now the bottom had fallen out of the market, the whole subprime mess, Fannie and Freddie reeling, AIG, the banks teetering, not to mention the company stock. A year ago, it was over 80, and he and April could have gone off and planted tomatoes somewhere for the rest of their lives. Last Friday, it closed at 12. It would take him another decade to recoup. Immediately flashing to his positions, his stomach wound into its usual 2 a.m. knot. Now April was hearing voices. I'll go take a look. In the last months, April had watched as her husband dropped 10 pounds from the stress. She knew that something was wrong. She knew the firm was hurting and how much they were relying on him, how much he was expected to produce. Mark never shared much about his positions anymore. The pressure on him was crazy. She leaned over and put her hand on his shoulder. Honey, will this ever get back to normal? He threw off the covers and grabbed his robe. This is the new normal. That's when they both heard another noise, a creak on the stairs. Mark put his finger to his lips for her to keep quiet. Then another, closer, a knife slicing through them. Someone was coming up the stairs. Mark, April caught his eyes. Amos stopped barking. He nodded, feeling the same thing inside. I know. The next creak seemed to come right from the upstairs landing. April's heart skipped a beat. Her husband's gaze was unmistakable. Someone was in the house. Just stay there, he said, nodding to the bed, raising a hand for her to stay silent. They all knew about the recent rash of home break-ins going on in backcountry. They were all just talking about it last Saturday night with the Rudenbachs at Mediterraneo. Mark listened closely at the door. They never put on the alarm. What the hell did they even have the damn thing for anyway, he'd asked himself a hundred times, just wasting all that stupid money. Truth was, he couldn't even remember the damn code or even where the panic button was. Mark. He turned. He stared at April's freckled face, her soft, round eyes, her hair raised in a nighttime ponytail, except now he saw only fear in it and helplessness. Becca, Evan, she whispered. Their rooms were just down the hall. He nodded firmly. I'll go check it out. He took a step, and suddenly the bedroom door flung open. 
Two men wearing ski masks and plain blue work uniforms pushed their way into the room. April let out a scream. What the hell is going on? What are you doing here? Mark stepped up to them. The first one in the overall suddenly knocked him with a fist to his face back onto the bed. Mark, April reached out to him. Her husband removed his hand and stared at his fingers. There was blood all over them. What the hell do you want, he demanded. Shut up, the first one in the ski mask said. The man was large, his voice husky. A tuft of reddish hair peeked out from behind his mask. He had a gun accounting for the blood in Mark's mouth. Just shut the fuck up and you might live. Oh God, Mark, please, April murmured, her heart accelerating wildly. Her thoughts flashed to her children sleeping down the hall. Just keep them away. The second man shut the bedroom door behind them. The one with the gun came over and pulled April off the bed. Get up, put your hands behind your back. His accomplice removed a roll of duct tape from his uniform and twisted April's wrists behind her back, binding them tightly. She looked at her husband with fear in her eyes as he ran a second piece of tape across her mouth. What do you want with us, Mark pleaded, helpless, watching his wife being bound. Listen, I've got a safe downstairs. We've got some money. He shot April a steadying look as if trying to say, hang together, honey, it'll be okay. That's why they're here, for the money. This isn't the first one. No one's been hurt so far. Where, the one with the gun demanded. Downstairs in the study, I'll show you. Look, we haven't seen your faces. We don't know who you are. Just take what you want and let us go, okay? Show me, the man with the gun grabbed him by the arm and pulled him up. That was when, to both their horror, the bedroom door opened again and their daughter, Becca, half asleep, wearing a baby blue Greenwich High sweatshirt and rubbing her eyes, wandered in. What's going on, guys? Before she could even let out a scream, the second intruder grabbed her and covered her mouth. Please don't hurt her, Mark begged, seeing his daughter's face turn white with alarm. She's just a kid. Eyes wide, April struggled against her binds, trying to get to her. Oh, baby, no, no. Becca tore the man's hand away. Mom? They watched, unable to do a thing, as the second intruder wrapped the tape around Becca's mouth and roughly bound her hands. Her uncomprehending eyes were round with fear. Throw him in there, the man with the gun directed his accomplice, pointing to the master closet. Becca, who had always carried a fear of small places, twisted her head back and forth, trying to resist. Unheeding, the accomplice shoved the two of them in. April fell to the floor, twisting against her binds. Don't do anything foolish, she tried to say to Mark, desperation in her eyes. Just give them what they want, please. They shut off the lights in the closet and closed the door. Her daughter let out muffled screams, writhing against April in the darkness. All April could do was huddle as close as she could, trying to convey with all her strength that everything would be okay. Just stay calm, baby. They're only here for the money. They're going to leave, and this will all be okay. Daddy will come get us. I promise, honey, please. Tears glistened in her teenage daughter's eyes. April put her head against her, trying to transfer all her conviction and strength, and she began to think, her hair is so soft, and she smells so pure, my little girl. Now she'll remember this the rest of her life. You bastards, you've stolen the innocence from her, her trust. Her thoughts flashed to Mark downstairs. Mark, please, just give them anything. Don't do anything heroic. Just let them go. And then to Evan, only seven, sleeping down the hall, her sweet little baby. Just sleep, honey, through it all. It's going to be okay. Please, Evan, please. It's... That's when she heard the sound. Two far-off pops coming from downstairs. April and Becca looked at each other. She'd heard it too. April's heart began to leap with fear. Mark! Panicked, tears started to run down her cheeks. What did you do, Mark? What did you fucking do? Suddenly there were footsteps, heavy ones, pounding back up the stairs. Becca squealed, her large eyes doubling in size. The whole house seemed to shake. What did you do? Desperately, April fought against her binds. She looked at her daughter. All she could do was simply press herself into her as tightly as she could, panic building in her daughter's eyes. My babies! April started to cry, her thoughts flashing to Evan as the approaching thuds entered the room. Oh my God, what's going to happen to him, my poor, sleeping boy? Do whatever you have to do to me, but please, not him, not to Becca. The closet door flung open. Light burst in their eyes. Not my babies, April tried to scream. She threw herself in front of Becca. Not them, not them. She stared back at the hooded faces with eyes that were both begging and defiant. Please. 